Hey, there I am. What up? <laughs> What's happening? Coming to you live from downtown Chico, California, from the home office. Um, welcome, nerds. I'm doing pretty good. Good. I got my uh, mama bear cup because that's I'm a mama bear. There seems to be a bear in it. It's an eyelash hair. I really do. I really do have some some lovely eyelashes. I got to tell you, cultivated from only the finest of silks. Uh, any good stories today? Uh, yeah, I'm sure. We'll figure. I don't know if there's ever ever been any good stories, but I'm cert I'm certain that I'll stumble onto one or two. On one last night, I don't remember what it was. Oh, it was when we my 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 um I, when my father and I when I was a young well I was a young lad on the farm in uh up in uh just out to, outside of Red Deer, Alberta, and it was cold. It was two seasons. It was cold and mud. Hmm. Anyway, uh, my father woke me up one morning. I don't know how old I was. I, I was preteen, but I don't think I was in diapers, so I must have been more than nine. <laughs> anyway, he, he said, hey, get up. It was a weekend. It was early in the morning, and we went outside and we slaughtered a steer. Or something. I had no idea what we were doing. Uh, there's more to that story. It's a bit more interesting, but... I'll just let, let that let that hang for now. Uh, it is Friday, November something, twenty uh, seventh, the day after uh, American Thanksgiving, which they take very seriously here. It's like a Christmas, only um, m more arguing. But I didn't get into any arguments. You guys hear me? Okay. Look, my face, it's really big. Um, I wonder if you can, does anybody know if you can adjust the camera lens on a MacBook camera? Audio is good, thank you. Luca, hi, how are you? Um, oh my goodness. Sarah, what are you doing? Get, go back to bed. It's too early for you. Um, I'm in a different location due to COVID. Um, no, it has nothing to do with COVID. It has to do with the fact that my family is loud, which is kind of due to COVID. Um, today, uh, let's see. There we are. Today I was going to, uh, in bed on you. That's how I should, hey, Kirsty, how are you? Good morning, afternoon to you as well. Um, and Luca, it must be, what time is it where you're at? You are in, uh, Rome, I believe. Um, I think I, I want to I want to walk through a couple of of, uh, of fairly. Some of you have seen this. You've seen me do this before. The pose to pose versus straight ahead lecture. 18 p.m. What is that? 6 p.m. in non military time. Um. I want to talk quickly about just animation process methodology. I, I, you know, with uh, this stuff in Maya can get really, really um, confusing. And, and one of the most difficult things is trying to keep control of your animation um, because you get all these, all these keyframes going, these offsets, and you can move things around. And one of the big, one of the big um, uh, perks of Maya is also one of the big distractions, which is you can see movement straight away, and have a bit of a uh, um, um, a bit of a, a go at traditional animation, hand drawn animation. You can do it in Photoshop. There's lots of free software packages out there that you can animate in. Just even do it with a mouse. But you can pick up like these little tablets. I have one around here somewhere. Little Wacom, Wacom, Wacom tablets. Uh, it's really really helpful to. Um, Think of your animation in terms of just a series of poses arranged on a timeline that only gives you the illusion of movement. Um, 
It is a lot more difficult than what people think. It gives you the illusion of movement when you scrub the timeline or when you flip the, the pages or when you shoot in, in traditional animation when you, sh when you capture the, the, the poses. Um, taking a run at 2D and just having a go, just even having a bouncing ball or, and then take a simple character and just have them sit, do a sit to stand or, and, and it doesn't have to be super, super fancy. You know, it can, it can be as simple as, as, um, character that's just, you know, it's just something really, really simple. I'm drawing with a mouse. No, no, um, no, no arms, just shapes, right? So you're just going from C shape to C shape. And then once you, once you have, you know, a couple of, um, a couple of poses like that, then move in between those poses, get some in-betweens and, and play around with it. Glenn Keane does a great, there's an online lecture that he does of a sit to stand. Um, well, I don't actually know that his character stands. I think it's the char his, his character just moves forward in their chair, grabs the arm. But it's a really, really good, simple lesson on on the um, on that the animation principle of overlap, which I would I would sort of argue that everything that I'm doing, um, when with animation, all when, whenever I'm posing out my animation, my my thought process is. I mean, there's a lot of different things to look for, but my, one of my big thought pro processes are I'm just looking for opportunities for overlapping action. And remember, overlapping action. Is is a principle that was designed to help ease changes of direction in animation. If our if our character is floating through space, um, that's essentially two keyframes. We don't really care. We don't need a lot because there's no gravity. There's no change of direction. We, you know, are floating through space. Our character's the prisoner of inertia at that point. But as soon as that character changes direction, it's hit by an asteroid. Well, that's when all hell breaks loose, and we need to um, um, sort out how to change that. How to ease that change of direction. So, for example, my hand is moving like this, very stiff, but if I drag my fingers back and forth, it's a lot more appealing for the idea. Anyway. You guys with me so far? I'm trying not to slurp my coffee. It's hard not to drink, hard to drink coffee without slurping. Dirty cup. You can only ever drink coffee out of a black cup, so you can't see all here. Sanjay, I have started doing animation a few months back. Please tell me what to explore as I am a student and want to learn more in animation. Well, you came to the right place. Um, Sanjay, are you using Maya? Are you working in 3D animation or 2D animation? I'll say this overall, keep it simple. Uh, so many of us, myself included, uh, overshoot. There's always this, there's, 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 there's always going to be a gap between your uh, talent and your ability. Um, we, we drink coffee in cups. What? How do you drink it? You just like sip it out of a spoon? 3D animation Maya, yeah, yeah. So there's always a, a there's always going to be a gap between your skill and your ambition. Yeah? So, which is good. There always should be. But if that gap is too large, meaning that you're not completely aware of what your skill set is, and then you 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 enter into to doing something that's beyond your skill set. And if you do that consistently, you're gonna risk eroding your motivation to do it because, oh yeah, Luca, you're drinking those little tiny uh it's wrong. You got these little, you got this massive coliseum and little tiny coffee cups. What the hell are you going to get on with your day if you got to drink like a little, if it's just a snort of coffee, what good is that? You need like, dude, in America, you got to have a mug. You got to say it like a, a, a coffee. And it's got to taste like garbage. Like, like, uh, ever stuck your tongue on a battery? You got to sort of have that. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the, what I'm saying, Sanjay is, is, uh, uh, do small little assi animation assignments or exercises. Don't, 
do 300 frames just nice little 50 frame pieces of animation like what i have here i have this little thing that goes like that like 30 frames perfect red bull that stuff's legit um um so hard to keep up with all you guys in here you drinking and start with maya so for me as an animator uh oh so back to the to post to pose versus straight ahead that sort of thing in maya we can see movement right away and that's very distracting so what happens is we start to to pose out our characters and then we give we then we rush into seeing how, what it looks like when when we when we scrub it because that gives us information that we desperately need because we're not really sure uh how to look at stepped or blocked out animation hard to it's hard to judge the timing especially if there's no audio so we rush to to, to see it move which means we 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 start to lose um, focus on the important thing, which is the poses. If we have bad poses, we have bad animations. It's as simple as that. Am I teaching animation for free? Uh, no, not. I'm making so much money that I can afford uh, coffee by the mug. I'm rich. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, this is, this is all part of cgspectrum.com, uh, where we teach everything, um, animation, visual effects, modeling, um, oh, a ukulele lessons. If you don't have a ukulele, you're missing out because with a ukulele, you can just, when you're frustrated with your animation, you just pick it up and you can just do this over and over again. Um, concept art as well. Yes, we teach concept art. Do I ever do any 2D animation? Well, I'm glad you asked. No, not really. Uh, sometimes. Well, no. I started at, at 2D. That was that's what I that's what I I went to school to learn. I worked briefly as a 2D animator, but I stunk at it. Um, like I and I know you know I wasn't the worst 2D animator in, in the world, but I think I was a runner up. But no, anyways, I, uh, I, I was doing some 2D animation at a, at a studio called Bardell in, in Vancouver, and, and they were working on a film. I was working on a TV sh special, and concurrently there, were, there was another crew that was working on a, on a film called Sinbad, and so they were looking for in-betweeners, and so I, I tried my hand at in-between that. And they, um, it was just very, very hard. It was, it was, I, was, I was slow, and so that I went... I went back to school at that point. I know I was still in school. But I was getting ready to graduate. And so instead of graduating, I, I, um, I they, have a, they had a scholarship at the school I was going to. So I applied for the scholarship and I got it. And my scholarship was a built-in 3D education. Um, can you help us in doing any cricketing bowling action? Oh, boy. That's a good one. We could do that. Let's do that today. Um, please tell me how VFX and animation industry are correlated or interrelated, Sanjay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So visual effects is sort of a broad term uh, that sort of, uh, well, it, it kind of depends, I guess, on who you're talking to. So if you're working at a, at, a, at, a, at a primarily character animation studio, like your Pixar's or your DreamWorks or your Disney's, um, those are character animated, or sorry, yeah, character driven films right so they're 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 full 3d films character driven everything is 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 all about the animation and then so you have your animators who are sort of like the the, the divas and then you have um uh, then you have a uh, um a visual effects department that's doing all the explosions or the hair and all you know simulation department so so that's that's in the full 3d sort of cartoony style of, of animation there's those like i said the studios like your, your dreamworks and your pixars 
But then for live action films, so like Marvel films, things like, well, almost every film that's ever made also has, uh, they're, they're riddled with visual effects. So visual effects in that um, uh, context, it encompasses everything. So you're working on a film, the film is a Marvel film, and you got Iron Man flying in. Well, that's not really Iron Man, that is just a puppet. And the, you're an animating Iron Man, but you and you're you're a, a, an animator, a 3D animator, but you wouldn't necessarily call yourself a character animator. You're more of a visual effects animator because you're working in live action films, which is mostly what I did. My, my, um, uh, I I found that I kind of had a, had, a, had a a bit of a a niche for um, realism. Um, I could make things like my whenever I'd I'd, I'd try to push my animation, to make it cartoony. I'd always find myself sort of pulling it back until it looks like it belonged in, in the real world. And the weight seemed very realistic and the animation seemed very realistic. And so I, I just naturally fell into the into the sort of VFX animator mode. Um I'm looking for a scholarship too. I don't really know um um anything about scholarships, but I what I would say, you know international scholarships, but I would say to go on to cgspectrum.com. We're we're a lovely group. Um very supportive. Um, and see what um, uh, see see what uh, see what they say. Send us a, send us a, a an email. Um, wait, a cricketing bowling action. Well, that's going to be quite something. Here's what I'll ask you, uh, uh, Sesha. Um, can you send me some reference? Grab grab some grab a YouTube link. Throw it in the chat window. I'll, we'll fire it up and we'll jump on that. This is what I love. I was I was saying to a friend of mine this morning. Uh, I have a uh, got to do a two hour webcast, and I don't know what I'm going to talk about. And she said, "Well, you always seem to figure it out." And it's actually you guys who figured it out. Do I ever use Harmony or TV Paint and do 3D animation? I didn't at the time. Um, I, we were doing it. We were doing it on paper. Uh, well, I was doing it on paper. I'm old school, but I've seen I've seen I've had students and friends that use TV Paint. I love TV Paint by the looks of it. I don't really know it, but it looks like a super, super great program. I've seen some really, really nice work. Obviously, it's not the program; it's the it's the person running it that makes. It. But yeah, I, TV Paint I think is great. I don't know Harmony that much uh, or that well, but um, I've also heard good things. Again, I'm most I'm almost I'm almost yeah, um, exclusively Maya. Uh, in Scotland, our education is free, but I think the rest of the UK you have to pay. That's good for Scotland. Nicely done. Scotland gets the cool glasses. These are prescription. Anyway, um, you guys distract me. The ball and the tail. Any tips? Yes, Jean. Uh, forgive me if uh, uh, if I'm if I'm mispronouncing, but Jean Michel, I think. Are you, okay. Um, the ball and tail. With the tail, the the whole trick. The, the once you get like ignore the tail and just get that ball bounce and just do it up and down. Just start with something really, really, really simple, dead simple. And once you get that going. Um, just remember that it's it's what you're trying to do. The, the whole goal about, uh, and Luca Blender is amazing from what I know. The whole goal is you have a ball. Here it is, look at that ball. And you're just bouncing it up and down, but then you have this tail. So start the tail in just two shapes. It's just weed principle stuff. So you're gonna have the tail curved like so. Come on. There you go. Curve like so on one end. And then, you know, when the ball's jumping, I guess when it's coming up in the air, it's going to be sort of curved down this way. And then when it's falling, right here it's falling. It's going to be curved up this way. Don't get too uh, tricky with it. Don't get, you don't need a ton of poses. You're just going from this shape. I'll do it, I'll do it upright to. this shape that right and then as these shapes change do 
is right. So this shape, and then we'll go to this shape. My weed is pretty, pretty terrible. There we go. And then uh, uh, I graduated from CG Spectrum. Nice! That's awesome. I'm a software developer, complete noob in 3D animation. How long would it take to learn animation and change my career? Well, that is a great question, Kevin. Kevin, where are you in the world? Now, as this thing starts to change direction, the bottom goes out first. The top going. And it drags further out and it gets to here and this is groovy and then it'll start moving the opposite direction and the bottom will go out first this and the tip will keep dragging all the way back Eventually, oh, this isn't what I wanted. What I wanted was this, whatever that last one was. So you can see then, as my weed is going, there we go, weed principle. So with the tail, that's what you're looking for, just not a, on a, um, a vertical. I can just turn this thing on its side. So, you know, you're starting with a, a C curve and a C curve, and you're just getting between those C curves um, uh, as simply and in, 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 uh, naturally as possible. Um, oh, Kenya, Kevin, awesome. So I'm not, so the reason why I asked you where you were, because um, the, there, there is, there is a, uh, and it's less and less now, I guess. I was going to say there there's a, is a bit of a geography hurdle because the animation industry lives in certain areas of the world. UK is a big one. Vancouver, Canada also is big. Montreal, Canada. Um, there's San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, I know Cape Town has a wonderful studio uh, in, in, as far as Africa goes, but I'm not, outside of that, I'm not really sure. Uh, what program is this, man? This is Maya. Um, Autodesk Maya. Uh, so, but... Learning the animation skills, it's, it's just a matter of, um, of practice, like anything else. Um, and, you know, the, the trick is, what I always like to remind frustrated students of, is the, the people who do it the most do it the best, and that's it. There's Triggerfish. Yes. Thank you. Um, so there, there, there's a, you know, when I was learning animation, I was very frustrated, and I was very scared, and, and um, you know, because I bad so um so i uh i um I, I just sort of came to the conclusion like that that you know there was very few things i had i had control over in my life but one of the things i had control over was how good i get um at this craft and and uh i truly believe that and so i just did it all the time until i got good enough that somebody looked at my work and said well you might as well come here and do that um, so I did, and then, you know, and once you're doing it for a living, everything changes at that point. Uh, my blocking is pretty good while I'm, while I'm doing in between, it's complete messed up. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's get back on track. Okay. So. Blocking versus cleaning up your animation. So this is going to bring us back to what I wanted to talk about to begin with. So what, what we're going to talk about today is. The two methods of animation that were developed by those old coffin dodgers back, that's a two, that's a number two, by the way, um, back in the old Disney days. Pose to pose is one. And straight ahead, I'm writing with a mouse. And to, to make it even more impressive, I'm left-handed. But I'm mousing with my right hand. And I'm writing with my mouse with my right hand. So, uh, take that. So... Maya is free, probably possible, if 
you're a student, but yeah, it's bloody expensive. But you can you can sign up for the for the student version. Um, uh, what would you put in a reel for animation to look for a junior position or even an internship? Um, you, you guys are distracting me again. <laughs> uh, you want to have uh, you want to be able to show weight. That that is like cornerstone. You want to show weight. You want to have this sort of compelling. Um, uh, uh, feel to your animation, so everything needs to be believable. Believable weight. You can show an acting, a dialogue piece is good. Uh, a, a creature walk, maybe a creature jump. Um, it, it short demo reels are great. Remember, you're only as good as your worst piece that's on your demo reel. So if you got stuff on there that you're like, ah, it's filler, no filler. You're better off with ten seconds of amazing animation than with a minute of mediocre. Um, so yeah, you want to show weight, you want to show uh, a convincing performance of any type. It doesn't have to be dialogue. Pantomime is amazing. Uh, Maya is my favorite 3D application, yes, and also my least favorite. My least favorite software is whatever I'm currently using. Because um, they're frustrating. Okay. Post to post. So so the Disney folks were, were you know, this is all back in the day when they're, when they're hand drawing, they're traditional animators. Um, they um, uh, uh, they developed these two sort of strategies or, or workflow methodologies. One was called pose to pose, and pose to pose is just simply laying down poses on a timeline. So for something like I have here, I have this piece of audio. This piece of audio sounds like this. So very simple. Um, so I, I, I start by just coming up with some poses. I shoot some reference. Um, I use my reference. I don't have my reference with me anymore, but I should probably find that so lecture this properly. But I have a bit of reference, and I pull out some key poses, or other people like to call them story poses. Yeah, uh, those key poses um, are not easy to find, and so you're thinking about, well, what, what what do I what do I use for my key poses? I have this reference. The key poses for a a piece of dialogue are easier. To find because the dialogue is going to dictate where those key poses are. So if you look at my timeline, you can see where there's 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 two poses where my character is um, accented, where there's like the, the two loudest positions or loudest parts. There's not, and then there's face. And so this is really simple. I know that those two, which is actually right here, I know that those two poses are my main poses. So I start with just those two poses. So, it, you know, it ends up looking, you know, when I'm starting my, my animation. I start with, looks like this. Yeah, two poses. My my keys are in, in, uh, in steps, so I don't get distracted by movement, so I can just snap back and forth between these two poses. It doesn't look like anything at this point, but that's okay. Fine. I can live with that. The next poses that I do, I'm just going to undo all this. Mess. The next thing that I need is I need, um, I need, I need holds, and I need my very first pose. I can't start here because I want to get into the word not. This first pose is not easy to get. A lot of times, our 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 sort of beginning poses, if they're not an extreme pose and they're not hitting an accent, and if they're shot before it is. You know, you're matching to the shot before it. You have all other sort of complexities. What I do is I go to my extreme poses first, and then I go backwards. So if, if my extreme pose for the word not is my character all crunched up and bent over, then I'll get that first because it's broader, and I can see how I want this thing to look. Shoulders up, hands up, this kind of idea. right? Bent over, leg back, all that kind of stuff. Once I have that pose, I'll just go back to my original pose and relax it. So, um, I have these two poses. Fair enough. Um, working in step mode as opposed to, to straight ahead. Well, that's what I'm getting at. So, I, I, Danny 3D, I work in step to begin with. And the reason why I work in step to begin with is because I need to get my ideas across to my director or whoever it is that's signing my paychecks. So I don't want to spend a bunch of time to get my idea across. Plus, I want to be able to communicate very clearly, very effectively with the least amount of pain. So by working in steps, I can say to my director, this is my idea. 
and the director can look at it and they can very, very clearly see where my poses are, what my pose is doing. If I have a shot like this and it splines, just moving, and I'll show you what I mean by that. It's the whole thing's the whole thing just sort of moves. Especially if I don't have holds. So, you know, it's very common to have animation that, you know, looks like something like that. I'm just gonna I'm gonna play blast it because I think it works better in a over the over the interwebs. So if I have something that looks like this, right? You can kind of get an idea of what I'm trying to do, but now it's just this big soupy mess that doesn't have any accents. It doesn't really, really convey my idea. And plus, it doesn't really show where my key poses are. So I'm not communicating well. And again, the, 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 the quicker and more convincingly you can communicate your idea, the faster you can execute that idea and the more shots you're going to have on film, which to me is the whole point. If there's 200 shots that my studio is working at, I want to animate all of them. So I want to get my ideas across quickly, um, and I want to get my, my ideas on film. And as exciting as it is to see your animation on film, and it's exciting, I'm not going to lie, it is really exciting to see your work on film. To see your, to see your ideas on film, oh, and then to sit in a theater and see people react to it, um, that's amazing. That's an amazing feeling, great feeling. So I want to get my, my point across quickly. So, um, so then I work in step to begin with. And really all this is, is all I have at this point is one, two, and this is a, this is a key here, but it's, it's a hold. So it's the same pose. Three is my in-between, four. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six keyframes but only four poses. And I can knock out four poses, I mean, in a, in a matter of minutes. Uh, well, like 30 minutes. And so then I can show this to my supervisor. And we can have a conversation about it. And they can say, oh, let's get his hand up a little bit higher, or let's get into this last pose a little bit more quickly, whatever, I, we can have a conversation. Or they can say, no, I was sort of assuming that this character was gonna be sitting in a chair. Oh, well, good I didn't waste any time with that and clean this stuff up. Um, I don't do any clay sculpture in studying animation. I don't, it's an, it's an amazing idea. I just don't do it. Um, I'm very precious about my fingernails. I don't wanna get clay underneath them. Ugh, that's not why. But uh, um, I think it's a good um, So, um, so anyways, that's why when I'm first blocking out my animation and I'm in, I, I keep it in step mode because it just is, is, is just the, the clearest way that I know to communicate my ideas. Now, back to pose to pose. So what I just did here, blocking out my animation, this was what is known as pose to pose animation. And if I was to continue working pose to pose, I would continue to, 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 to drop in poses where I thought they, they went and that's in, until my whole timeline was, was, uh, completely covered in poses. So from a traditional standpoint, you just keep, you, you have these drawings and then you do some in-betweens and you just keep doing pose to pose. It's a lovely way to animate and you always have control of your animation that way. Now, I, 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 to those of you who have taken, uh, have studied with me before, you've heard this analogy, but I use the ana analogy of a road trip, yeah? So I could say, hey, Danny 3D, you and I are going to go on a road trip. And you say, oh, Mark, that'll be fun. Where should we go? And I said, uh, well, let's drive up to Vancouver. It's about a 12 hour drive and you say, great, when do we leave? And I say, we're gonna leave at 8.01, not a minute before, not a minute after. I have the entire thing planned out. We are making four 15 minute stops for gas and for a bio break, that's it. Plan everything, we gotta be there by uh, 11 p.m. on Tuesday. Okay, and uh, um, so we, I pick up at 8.01, we drive, we get there, it's awesome. Somebody says to you, hey, Danny 3D, uh, so how was your trip? And you say, well, it was uh, effective, but boring. Uh, we just, we did what we said we we're gonna do. We, we, we had a goal and we nailed it and it was great, but it's kind of dull. So, fine, safe, oh, that's what they found with, with, with the pose to pose. If you, if you use the pose to pose strategy throughout your entire 
animation process, it it's just kind of stiff. Kind of, it gets you, you have a starting point, you have an ending point, these are these two poses, and then you have this movement in the middle that's just stiff. I'm sure most of you that have spent some time animating have, have run across this. Um, Kevin, yes, I, would, I will give you my thoughts on specialization or generalists. Um, uh, in, in one minute, remind me if I forget. There's a lot going on in this little tiny head. I have a seven and three eights hat size, so you know. Uh, and I have a hat. So, so then, um, in the, in this, in this sort of exploratory, uh, um, realm that the, this pioneering phase that the Disney people were in, they tried another method. It's known as the straight ahead method. And the straight ahead method is you put down a piece of paper, you draw a pose. Then you, they were animated on twos. Then you go two frames ahead and you draw another pose. Then you go two frames ahead and you draw another pose. We don't have this pose. We don't have any of these other poses. We're just drawing poses. Yeah. And they found by doing that, they could do really crazy. They would surprise themselves on where they would animate. So again, if we use the, the, uh, the road trip analogy, I say, Hey, uh, Hey, Kevin, uh, Mitty, we're going to go to, to, uh, Vancouver. And you say, okay, when are you picking me up? I'm like, I don't know sometime between eight and noon. And you go, all right. And I, so I come in and I pick you up at like 1043 and you go, uh, Hey, uh, what's our first stop? And I go, I don't know. And, uh, I don't have a map. Um, and we drive and we end up in Vancouver at like Friday at like 2 AM and we're completely disheveled. And somebody says, Hey, Kevin, how was your trip? And you go, Oh my God, it was so stressful. We ran out of gas. We got lost. It was awful but amazing because we went off track and we found this awesome like waterfall and and then we met these people and we were lost and they 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 gave us food and as stressful as it was i it is absolutely memorable absolutely memorable which is kind of the point too so there's these two methods one is like effective but dull one is um uh exciting memorable but useless because once what they found was straight ahead is once you got to the end you were basically had all these cool parts in this animation shot but it's completely unusable because it's just a mess so they discovered that it was the best method was a hybrid obviously a hybrid of the two methods so with that in mind, we start pose to pose. Yeah. So this is what I've done here. I've set this thing up with these poses. So now I have a, um, a uh, map, let's say. And I've also compartmentalized my, my animation. It's not, it's no longer a 30 frame, 40 to 70. It's no longer a 30 frame piece of animation, but it's two pieces of animation. One is five frames long and then there's a hold and the other is six frames long and then there's a hold that's it so now instead of 30 frames i have one five one six what is that 11 frames in <laughs> you imagine if i got that wrong um which is way easier for me to navigate than 30 and i do this if i have 300 frames of animation i don't really have 300 frames of animation i have like you know um bunch of little sections and so i don't spline the whole thing i used to do this i used to have to have block it all out and then i'd spline the whole thing and there'd be all this stuff crashing in there'd be all these distractions i don't do that i just find myself two poses and then i just bring my timeline in and i get in between those two poses as simply and elegantly as i possibly can and then i move on to the next two occasionally i zoom out my timeline i play blast the whole thing to make sure i'm not getting too off track uh, but for the most part um just getting between two poses that's it and i get between those two poses in a straight ahead manner i'll show you what i mean so let's just say we started this whole thing off like we have here with um with my first pose well i got i got this this pose first and then i went back and found this one so i got these two poses and then I, I made this little in-between pose, get up into this pose. Well, 
I need a hold. So I copy this pose here on 45. I select the entire rig. Remember up, up top here, I turn everything off. Can you guys see that? I turn everything off up here, except for my nerves curves. So I can just select my rig. And then I just hold down middle mouse on my timeline and I drag this thing out to where was I? Like 56, I think. 54? 54. And let go of my middle mouse button and hit S. And I've just copied that, that pose over. Don't know what that. We'll just leave that for now. Um, oh. Next. Um, so now I have this hold. But I also want to hold. At the end, when he gets into this position. So I do the same thing. I go to frame 60. I hold down my middle mouse, drag that over, hit S. Now, when I spline this, and I always use the auto tangents, always when I'm splining, use auto tangents. Not always, but almost always. You can go into your settings and preferences, go to settings, animation, and my default in and outs are set to auto. S tangents. They're kind. Um, I think they're vegan tangents. Anyway, um, animation will click eventually. Yes, it does seem to. So now if, if I, if I uh, play blast this, oh, like, spline the whole thing on you, spline. There we go. Uh, now if I, if I play blast this, you'll be able to see my holds. Now it's all moving at the same speed. There's not much to see here, but you can you can see where my holds are, and I cannot um, uh, stress strongly enough the importance of holds. If you don't have holds, you just have this smeary, smeary mess. Somebody just said earlier, um, I block out well everything. I block out my animation really well, which means you you're probably quite good at posing, which is hard. Uh, it's a, that, that's a, that's, that takes some study for sure. But then it, everything falls apart when you start to in between. Get your holds down and be super, super deliberate about where your holds are. So you can see with me, I just duplicate it. It's called, uh, a lot of animators call it copied pairs. Right? So I copied my animation over because I want to designate my holds. That gives me rhythm. That makes my uh, animation read. Animation is, is communicated by the juxtaposition or the contrast between holds and movement. Have to have those holds. Now, clearly we don't want those holds to stick. We want to have what we call um, slow ins and slow outs. Right? So we want to ease into our holds and ease, ease out of our holds because if it sticks, our character freezes. Well, we don't want our character to freeze. Not in this instance. Sometimes we do. For the most part, we don't want our character freeze when things stop in maya they stop uh more completely than anything in nature stops i said this to a, a, a class one time students and somebody said well what about when you're dead and i said oh well you still decompose and if you ever watch those uh unless videos of somebody decomposing i've seen i've seen let's see I've, I've seen it i've seen a leaf do it you can't see it but you know people do slowly like erode so there's always, there just seems to always be movement in nature. Somewhat. In Maya, no. So, the next thing that I do, that now that I have this all blocked out, and my director says, yeah, Mark, that looks good. Let's continue on. Well, I don't want this hold to be complete. I want to have a wee bit of a cushion in there. So, I'm going to go, knowing that 45 and 54 are identical. I'm going to delete 45. Bum, bum, bum. Now I have two poses. Yeah? I have 40 and I have 54. And every single frame in between those two poses is a pose. Just because I haven't set a key on it, it's still a pose. And I am responsible for every single pose, for every single frame, and every single pose on it. And that's, a, that's something that took me a bit of time to... to, to uh, uh, realize was that even though there's not a key on it, it's still a pose. When my audience sees it, when the director sees it, when anybody sees it, they don't know which poses I've keyed and which poses I haven't. They just see a series of poses and they go, I don't like that pose. And 
I can respond, well, that's not opposed. That's, I didn't put a keyframe there. And then they would say, I don't care what you did about it. I just don't like it. Fix it. So now that I have this uh, uh, series of poses here between 40 and 54, I need a pose for frame 45, my hold pose. I want that pose on 45 to not be exactly like 54, obviously, because that's where it was, but I want it to favor 54. Every single pose in here either favors 40 or 54. And if we go right into the middle, it's an actual, between the two of them, it's, an, it's, a, it's a true in-between. I set a key there. Nobody cares because this thing is just like, just slowly smearing into the next, oh, the next key pose. So instead, I'm going to go to frame 50, oops, 52, which is a frame and a pose that favors my pose on 54. I'm going to key 52. And I'm going to take this, holding on shift and left click, okay, and drag that thing back to 45. I think I will. So now I have a pose on 45 that starts my hold and it's almost identical to 54, but you see there's a little bit of. How exciting! I know what you're thinking. You, you're thinking, Mark, by God, that's genius. Truly. That's how, that's, that's a really, really quick way to get yourself a moving hold, yeah? The first thing I do after I'm finished blocking my animation out is I go through and designate these little moving holds. I'll do it here. So as, as you know, 60 and 70, exactly the same, right? Um, I don't want them to be exactly the same. So again, I will delete 60. Try, right, there we go. I'll go to frame 68, see that. Now I have these wee little cookies. That's right. I'm the Top Gun animator. I always thought, when I saw the movie Top Gun, I always thought I was more of a goose than a maverick. Really much of a maverick. I'm way more of a, of a goose. Plus, Goose was married to Meg Ryan, that movie, which is... Um, Meg Ryan could ever go for an animator like me. Anyway. So now I have these moving holds. My timeline, as you can see, is still very clean, very easy. If my director says, I want the character to get into this pose earlier, I say, no problem, director. Let's go this fast. I still have lots of, I'm still fully in, in, uh, in control. Um, did I finish the film? Yeah, I, I saw I saw Top Gun in the theaters. Um, it was very exciting. Exciting. Anyway, uh, so I'm gonna deviate for just one minute. I want to talk about camera. You guys want to talk about cameras? Let's talk about camera. Because I've 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 made the error of posing out this character in perspective mode and unless we're working on a video game cycle um or anything that belongs in a video game we want to animate to a camera because wherever the camera goes it's going to change our pose like if we're here let's say i probably want to bring this arm out get myself some so if i'm not animating to a camera i'm constantly going to be tweaking my poses Gonna get anybody. So here's how I do my cameras. And if you're working on a on a project in a studio, they give you the camera. The camera's in the scene when you open it up, and that's fine. You don't have to do anything about it. You just have to animate to the camera. A maverick. Oh, yeah, I have broken into song at a bar before, for sure. Um but I, but I wasn't, oh no, I have, I have broken in, I wasn't, I was going to say I wasn't dressed as a tailor. No, what were they? Aviators. But I have broken in this song at a bar dressed as a sailor. And it was not Halloween. Uh, so, again, that's more goose. 
The first movie you saw at the theater was Toy Story? Wow, that's amazing. Well, no wonder you're here. The first movie I saw, uh, uh, because, you know, I was born before there was, before there was dirt. Uh, the first movie I saw was at a drive-in movie, and um, it was a movie called uh, Aristocats. Remember it? And the drive-in where I grew up was three screens, yeah? Called the 40th Avenue Drive-In. We had three screens. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. On one screen, they showed family films like the Aristocats. On the other screen, they showed like action films like in that day would have James Bond movie, John Connery. On the third film, they showed pornography. Believe that? So, so as a like a, a nine-year-old boy, all I had to do was this, and I could see people making babies. A crazy thing. So my parents were constantly like, hey, keep your eyes on the cartoon cats. <laughs> Anyway, that's crazy. Um, my favorite animation movie. I love that question. What's my favorite animation movie? Oh, The Incredibles. It has to be The Incredibles. That thing was perfect. Absolutely perfect. I wanted for nothing. Toy Story was also very, very good. Uh, your dad didn't think animation would ever be 3D. Your dad was in good company at that time. Man, they did a... The, the most impressive thing was toy, with Toy Story. If you if you if you look at at how at the animation software, and at the, in those days, Pixar was the only one who had this animation software because Ed Catmull was the only one who developed it in, in New York in the seventies, and they had a piece of animation software called Marionette, which is still what they use. And, and Pixar was created as a software company, not as an animation company. And they hired John Lasseter from Disney because they just needed an animator. He was an animator at Disney, and they just needed an animator. To showcase the software they weren't going to make movies they just needed to showcase the software so john lasseter made this short film called luxo jr you know with the lamps and the ball and the flatness and, the... and they showed it at that at like one of the very first seagraphs which is the big conference they have every year the nerd conference and they showed it at seagraph and it was a hit and they just showed it to to, to uh to um showcase the software they like, look look at this crazy stuff we're doing but the first questions that they got from the audience, they did a Q&A with it, was what was the gender of the lamps? You know, which meant people were interested in the stories. Um, and then uh, Luxo Jr., I think, won an Oscar that year for Best Short Animated Film. And so that is what we watched Pixar. But what's fascinating is that, is that when they made Toy Story, the first Toy Story, they didn't have rigs like this where you could select pieces of your puppet and move it around. Everything was done in the channel box. But, and you couldn't do this either. You had to type in the value numerically. No, not quite. Oh, can you imagine? So when you watch Toy Story, by if you if you like a, a parrot, contrast it with um with a with a, like Utopia, for example. You can see that Utopia is. Uh, the, the animation, the rendering, everything is far more advanced. But when you think about what they were using, and the, the funny thing is, is when you watch the behind the scenes of Toy Story, it's Pete Docter, who was a, a young animator at Pixar at, at the time. He went on to direct, um, well, he directed Monsters, Inc. He directed Up, very talented man. Um, he's so proud. Like he's showing off, like, look how clever we are. We just type in these numerical values, and look, the shoulder goes like this. <laughs> You're like, holy sh! That's insane. Um, the other thing about Toy Story, next time you watch it, watch the blinks because they offset the blinks, so the eyes always go. And once you once you see that, it ruins the entire movie for you. You're just distracted by it the whole time. It's like when you listen to Metallica. And somebody goes like, listen to after everything that the guy sings, what's his name, Jim, James Hetfield, after every line, he says, ah, and then it ruins Metallica. I think I, there's this joke that Metallica was actually, the name was Metallic, but when James Hetfield said, Metallica, uh, I didn't write it. Anyway, cameras. So I want to find a good, so for this, 
I'm just gonna have uh let's just set our 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 camera. We're just gonna have I'm not a huge advocate of having a, my character like talk to the screen, break the fourth wall. But that's what uh um that's what uh, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have our character and you know, any again, any of you that have been in, in, in any of my classes know that I don't like Joe character looking straight into the screen. So let's just three quarter it a little bit. Fair enough. So I'll go, ah oh, yeah, yeah, that looks uh that looks pretty good. I like that. Um uh Sesha says uh, I'd like to know how to strong pose a character. Oh yeah, so that's a that's practice. Practice, 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 practice. So even if the camera angle changes it, it won't look weird. Um so uh reference and practice. And you do a lot of this. You go, well, is his weight? You know, sometimes I'll I'll have a pose like set like this and, and it'll look good. And I'll say, hey, that's a pretty good looking pose right there. But then if I move my camera, I go, oh, he's going to fall backwards. I move my perspective. He's going to fall backwards. So, so just make sure that you're navigating around a lot and making and make sure that it's the, the pose is strong. And any angle is, is a good idea, but it's mostly important that it looks good in your camera. So I say to myself, there's my camera. So now I go, um, oh, Argentina. This is really live, Shalom. It's really live. Well, I think there's probably about a five second delay, just in case I get a little too colorful. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm gonna go up here to, to view, and uh, I'm gonna scroll down to create camera from view. See that? I'm gonna left click it. it makes it sound. And now I've created a camera. So if I go to panels, perspective, I have a camera here that, because I've done this before, it's perspective too. So I'm going to click on that camera, and then to make sure I'm in that perspective, and then this little icon under the word view. Oh crap! You guys can't see me because I'm picture in picture. Down here. There we go. So. Here I am, view. That red band now is going to bother my mind. All right, we're doing it. Um, I need like a tech crew just to get me through these things. So uh, I, I went view, create camera from view is, is how I um, created my camera. And then if I select this little camera icon under the word view, you guys see all this stuff okay or is it real grainy? Is it clear? I'm going to assume it's clear. And once I, I select the, the um, uh, camera here, I can go over to my channel box, and you hear it says Perspective 2. I'll just double-click on it, and I'll just call it Camera. Or whatever, for, for lack of a better... I'm not very creative with my camera name. So now I have my camera. Then I'm going to open my Attribute Editor. In my attribute editor for my camera, I have these, these two attribute tabs. I'm going to go to camera shape, and I'm going to start making some adjustments in here. But first, I'm going to go back to panels, and I'm going to select tear off copy. Oh, uh, Kevin, you should do a video on not just to practice, but practice smart so you advance faster. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, so now I've torn this off and I, the reason why I want to tear this off is because I still want to be able to work in my perspective view, but I want to see it in my camera view. So now I'll go back to my main window and I'll select panels and I'll go to perspective. So now I can move around here and you see it doesn't affect my camera, which is important. Okay. So now with my camera selected, um, I'm going to, um, just go over here into the attribute editor and I'm gonna make some changes. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down here to this, the display options and I'm gonna set up my film gate. So I'm gonna select uh, display film gate and then I'm going to make the my gate mask color black. And I'm gonna make it opaque just because I just like it. Crank up the opacity. So there is my film gate. That's what my, when I render this out or play blast it, that's what it's going to look like. And I think to myself, that looks kind of cool but I want to adjust my film aspect ratio because I want it to look more cinematic. And 
right now, if I look up here at, at my film aspect ratio, it's set to 1.5. Now, the film aspect ratio is just basically the relationship between the width and the height of your camera view. The 1.5 is like, it's, it's half again as wide as it is tall. So it's a little bit boxy. And see if it was set to one, it would just be a square. Yeah, just a square. I like to set it to 1.85 because that gives me a bit of a widescreen, which I just think looks more cinematic. Now, if you're a Quentin Tarantino fan or of, uh, who's that guy who makes those, who made Fight Club, that guy's name? Damn it. Anyways, they like to shoot often in 2.35, which is like ultra, David Fincher, which is like ultra wide, which looks super, super cool. And then once you set that up, you got to, you know, reposition the character. Fits in. Let's go with 2.35. Super fun. Once I get that all set up, uh, we can play around the focal length a little bit, but I don't really mess with it too much. How many shot changes in a piece of animation would you say is too many or advisable? How many shot changes in a piece of animation, Kirsty? Um, how many revisions? Is that what you're asking? Like, um, I'm glad my screen is clear. So let me get just, I think what you mean, Kirsty, is how many revisions? And that sort of all depends. Um, it just all depends. Um, um, uh deviant marsupial I'll, I'll answer that uh oh camera angles oh 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 um well you know cameras are real tricky so i know a lot of us when we first start working with cameras myself included we get a little bit heavy-handed with it it, we, it moves too much but it's just a story element you know and if you watch if you watch um if you, if you take a piece of film and just watch that piece of film, not like out of context of the story, because we don't notice these things when we watch movies. You get caught up in the movies because they're, they're typically so well made. But if you just take out sequences, go onto YouTube or whatever, and just watch a sequence, you can watch the camera and you can watch like the language of composition, camera movement. A lot of times it's just a simple push in because if you, the character's saying something. Important. And so you feel yourself, I and mean, I know you've all felt this because you've all watched movies or you've watched uh, visual stories. You find yourself leaning in, but you're not really leaning in. The camera's just slowly pushing in, and it feels kind of good. Like it feels like that scene's right. And so it tells you to watch all kinds of the study on, on, on cameras, camera movement, camera angles, editing, camera cuts. It's highly in. in uh, involved I, I spent a good deal of time working on well i i did some camera work for the movie tintin which was co-directed by steven spielberg and peter jackson and that was incredibly challenging because both of those men have forgotten more about it ever know um but it was a good education but the first thing that they told me was too much movement too much too much and if i would would have additional cameras, they would often say you could say that single camera. So they're very, what do you say, economical. Um, Shalom, I, I've, I'm not currently working in a big studio. I have worked at big studios. I worked at Weta Digital in New Zealand and Sony Animation. Um, CG Spectrum is not my company, but I feel like it is. Um, Somebody asked about 2D animation. Do they ever use Maya Cartoon Network? Yes. You can see it once you, once you sort of, you animate for long enough, you can see the difference between 2D and 3D. So for example, if you watch, what is that TV show you see all the time? Futurama, yeah? So Futurama, they have that spaceship, that green spaceship. Uh, that thing's always 3D. You see it flying. And you can, you can tell it's 3D just by the way it's sort of rendered and also be animated on ones where 2D animation twos we can now back to my camera once I got my camera set up there's this little button right here my camera view and it's got a little lock on it click that lock that camera down and now 
Oh, and I can go into the show menu and turn off nerf curves. So now I can just see my character without worrying about, I can't move it because it's locked. And I usually animate, I have two screens, so this would go over the screen. But for now, when I just have one screen, I can just park it up here, back in the channel box. I'll just park this up here and I'll keep it real small. And as I'm going through my animation and posing, I can just go up here and I, I set my hotkey for play blast to zero. So I can do a quick play blast if I need to. I can watch watch this thing unfold. Uh, Shalom, you mentioned you have classes. Can you talk about them, please? Uh, sure. Um, well, I, I teach uh, online animation. It's just this. It's exactly this. So what we do is we have a, at CG Spectrum, we have a different programs. And with every program is a series of tutorials. Uh, lots of them. They're nice and short. They're, they're, they're all under 10 minutes. And they're a series of them. So they're easy to go through. It's step by step. Follow along. You do the work. Once a week, you upload it into a um, box folder that we share. And then you and I meet up like this. And I open up your scene file. And I look at it. And for an hour, I go through it and we talk about it. Um, uh, when we're done with that, I get, I, I show you what I would do. I, I look at your, your shots and I say, I tell you what's working and why it's working. And I tell you what's not working and why it's not. Working. And then I'll go through it and give you the most concise, um, advice that I possibly can. And then I leave it with you. You go back and then I upload the video of us talking about it. So you have that for reference. And you, you do another pass at it. And midweek, you upload a new pass. And then I do a video review. I just open up your shot. You're not with me at that time. And I go through it again. I upload that video to you. And then back uh, next week. Specified meeting time. We go through it all over again. We do that for 12 weeks or 36 weeks, whatever you sign up for. Um, the feedback sessions are through Zoom, yes. In animation, I get confused between breakdowns and in-betweens. The, the confusion is they're the exact same thing, really. Um, what I would say breakdown poses are, are anticipation poses, really. So if, if we look at this character, that's a great uh, question, deviant marsupial. Um, these are key poses that I have here on 40, uh, 45. Um, Sesha, I don't really know how much it costs. I kind of stay out of that. Um, that, but just go to the website and, uh, and, and shoot, uh, CG Spectrum, a, an email and, uh, they'll take really good care of you. Um, so these are, these are all my key poses. Yeah. These are all in-betweens, even though there's not any keys on them, these are in-betweens and I'll, I'll tweak those in-betweens. This on 37 or sorry, 57 is my anticipation pose. That's what I would call a breakdown pose. Right, so it's it's an important pose and it's an early pose and it's almost always an anticipation pose. That's what I would call breakdown. But it, the thing is, is everybody everybody uh, um, everybody has all these weird names for stuff that's not necessarily right. So you kind of have to just go with it and decipher it. What I would say it is, you don't really have to worry about it. Hey, I just got a, I just got a, congratulations, you received 100 messages today with Restream Chat. Thank you, everybody. Oh, it's so fun. Anyway, um, I got my camera. I got my, my, my key poses down. Now all I need to do is in between. The wonderful thing about in between is you can kind of just, or not in between, sorry. Now I'm going to move to straight ahead, which is in between. So now that I have this thing set up, I can drag my timeline in and I'll drag it to 54 because this is my, this is my hold. And so I have all of this space in which to work at. The terminology can be a bit intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best thing you can do when somebody says something you don't understand is just to say, uh, what do you mean by that? And we're hesitant to do that because you don't want to not know. But if you don't know, you don't know. And information is just all a bunch of stuff that nobody knows until they know it. And so what I do is I say in a room of people, and I, I, I've done this before, and I'll, even as an animation supervisor, you know, I, I took a job at a studio 
to as the animation supervisor for a film called Journey to the Center of the Earth. And when I got the job, I had a crew of young animators, and I showed up, and uh, they are using um, I, on my first day they're using 3D Studio Max. I'd never used it before, so I didn't know the software. And so I sat down and I said uh, to my group of animators, and I said, "Somebody's got to show me how to use 3D Studio Max." And one of the animators, who was a young hockey animator, said, uh, "You don't know how to use 3D Studio Max." And I said, "Look, it don't make me feel like an asshole. That's not okay. You didn't know how to use it either." Until you did, I'm telling you, I don't know how to use it. If we're gonna get along, you're gonna have to like let me uh, let me learn and not make me feel dumb for not knowing stuff. I don't know more than I know. You know what I mean? Like what I don't know is a way bigger list. So I'm going to say I don't know more often than I'm going to say I know, and that's hard from a leadership standpoint because people are looking to me for answers. But it's okay to say I don't know. What I do know. Is if we stay calm and we're respectful and we support each other, figure it out. Well, I, I would say some people are real jerks, yeah, but I don't think people are trying to be jerks. I just think that when people say things like that, they're just feeling intimidated and they don't know what to say. And so they're looking for an opening to, 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 um, to strengthen themselves. So, the, so your, your, your job as a, as, a, as a team member and as a leader is not to react that negatively to that, to call it out, but also understand that it's coming from a place of insecurity. So try to be as supportive as possible. But it is important to set a tone fairly early and say that's not appropriate. Um, I don't know all kinds of stuff. And if this isn't, if we're not open, the most important thing we could be really, I would think, or one of the most important things we could be is open to say, I don't really understand. Because if you, you pretend you understand and you don't, then you're in deep, deep trouble. Uh, Kevin, I have a noob question. How is the 3D industry? I.e., is it hard to get a job? Should I still keep a foot in software development as a backup? I'm really confused. Um, uh, yeah, it's, I would say it's, it's challenging to get a job. It, it's not challenging if you go, if, if you're, if you know what you're doing and if you've practiced and if you, you've developed a, a skill set that is, um, that is coveted, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're capable, I don't, I don't know any great animators that are struggling to find work. Um, if they are struggling to find work, then they must have some interpersonal skills. They must not get along with people very well. I have had that. I've had really talented animators on my team that couldn't re remain on my team because um, their interpersonal skills were like, it just, I worked with them and worked with them and worked with them and finally just had to say, listen, it's just, at the end of the day, we got to get this movie out and this is too much work. So um, this isn't a good fit, you and, you and me and the way we communicate. And unfortunately, I'm the one in charge. Um, there's only so much compromise that I'm willing to do. Uh, but for the most part, um, the industry is, yeah, it is challenging to get into. Um, it's hard to know what to do, like to all sorts of questions about, uh, about what should be on my demo reel. Should I be a generalist? Yes. Should I be a specialist? Yes. <laughs> this, there's no wrong answer. All, all the answer is, just do what you're compelled to do because that will keep your hands on your tool set. The only thing that you could do wrong is to do nothing. That's it. But that's not even true because sometimes you need a break to, to, to sort of protect your motivation. So doing nothing is sometimes a good choice as well. It's a crazy world out there. Uh, Mark, do you ever, did you ever do any animation internships when you were younger? Uh, Deviant Mars Supial, I was never younger. I've always just been old. No, I didn't do any internships. Um, now, this is this is an interesting uh, question, and uh, we'll get to animation again someday. But the interesting question, the, the, or the, the 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 what's interesting about this question is that um, um, I I went I started learning I started I went back to school to learn animation when I was thirty three years old. So when I say I wasn't younger, that's what I mean, is I was already, man, already like a, in my golden years. But I was older than everybody in, in my class by, the, the next oldest person was 23. So, and then I had a bunch of like 21s and 18 year olds. Um, so it gave me a sort of a, mo and I also had uh, two uh, young children. One, one was an infant, so, and I had to feed them. And uh, I didn't have any other income. 
me. Didn't find the money to feed my my kids, so I was very focused. My 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 co-eds would say would accuse me of having an unfair motivation advantage, <laughs> and I would I would agree. Um, I was terrified of going to jail for starving children. So, um, and I was bad. I was terrible at this. I was terrible at at, uh, at animation, but I I. I Knew because I think because I, I had done some stuff with my confidence, had some wins under my belt. I knew that I could figure it out. I just did. I think I did. Anyway, but getting back to the internship question, there's a there's a there's there's is such a thing as um, age discrimination in the workplace. There absolutely is. There's all sorts of discrimination in the workplace. Race, all that kind of stuff. But there is such a thing as age discrimination, and it wor was working in my favor. I realized that it worked. It's worked in my favor from my first job. I was 35. They, when you're 35 years old and you're a dude, white dude, and all these things, consideration, they just assume, uh, uh, employers just assume you're not going to do anything. Free that those days are, and they're correct. Those days were behind me. So yeah, no, I got offered lots of like, hey, uh, and you'll get this. Do you want to work for experience? No, I have experience. <laughs> I've got a lot of, you know, I steer with my dad when I was nine. Or, um, I'm not working for experience. I it's just it just wasn't an option for me. But you know, so people would say that once in a while, but I wouldn't do it. But I, when I when I began my animation career, um, it just was kind of a given that I wasn't going to work for them. And I also was hired at a higher rate than some of the younger people. And at first I felt kind of weird about that. But then I realized when I worked with these younger people that they, they kind of are un... Um, uh, they, they lose their, their composure. Quickly, this is a stressful industry. Deadline sense. It's working with computers that don't always cooperate, and I've I've found young men, especially young women, not nearly as much. Young men, um, when they're under pressure, they freak out. They freak out, and they and then I'm in there going like, "Hey, it's okay. Uh, you you know you." One of these days, you're going to bury your parents, so save it for that. <laughs> save, save the freak out until it matters. This is just talking cats. It's not a big deal. Um, and so, yeah, there's you, 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 you. Part of like quantifying like good job performance, there is something to be said about staying composed, because when you're composed, you can troubleshoot. And that's not to say I've never like you know kick a trash can or anything like that. Definitely I've had my moments of losing my, my mind, but for the most part. So that's a long answer. Um, Kevin, I would say uh, keep a foot in the software development as a backup. Well, here's the thing. If you're already established in an, in an industry, great. That's amazing. You'll always have that. Yeah? As far as keeping a foot in, I mean, I keep a foot in, in different industries just because I need to to keep socks on my feet. So, it, you know, at, at some point, and, you know, I have I have four children, so I have a lot of dependents. Um, so I, I have a different rule set. So anything that I do, um, out, well, I, well I'm, making, I'm making decisions based on the well-being of, of, of four young people who, What's the company you have worked first and what's the project? Can you tell us any moment in the industry which is memorable for you? Oh yeah, the very first job, thank you, uh, Sasha. The very first job I, that I worked at was at a studio in uh, Vancouver, Canada. It was 2003 and it was on the movie Garfield. And I was tasked with making the live action animals because it was a live action film with a 3D cat. I was tasked with, shot all this footage of cats and dogs then I had to make them look like they were. I thought they should have just put peanut butter in their mouths. 
um, like they did in the old days. But nobody wanted to hear that. So we made um, 3D uh, muzzles. We animated them. Um, yeah, it was a good job. Great job. Uh, Shalom, I've never worked in Montreal, although I've spent quite a bit of time there. I love that city. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful city. So cold. Terribly cold. Um, but I have a lot of friends who work there. And, uh, and I haven't heard anybody who's worked there who hasn't loved it. Uh, Shalom, where are you in, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, where are you at on the globe? While you're, while you're receiving that question, we just have a, a, a another half an hour left or so. so I want to walk through this, this, um, uh, oh, you're in Montreal. Nice. Lovely. Deviant marsupial, where are you? You love Canada and America. Your dream is to move to one of those places. You currently reside in... Wait, I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. A deviant marsupial. You must live in, uh, let's see, Madagascar. Scotland! Ooh, close. Neighbors. That's right. You said earlier, Scotland, that you had a um, free education. Okay, so now I'm going to get between these two poses. I just have two poses. It's three, really, but this is kind of the same pose. I don't really consider these two poses that deep. But I'm going to offset some stuff as I go. And as soon as you start using, or as soon as you start uh, offsetting keys, everything starts to get a little nutty, right? Like changing timing becomes more difficult. So I look at the end of my hold, frame 54, that thing's locked down. I'm not going to move anything off of frame 54. So this is like a barrier. So I can mess around in here all I want, offset keys all I want. This thing's going to protect everything past that. Don't have to worry about it. Um, I love, I, I, Shalom, I, 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 um, I learned this on, I learned uh, 3D animation on XSI and I loved it. It's, it was always my favorite software. Um, I don't know. I haven't used it since Autodesk took it over. When I started working on Garfield, we, we, they were using Lightwave. I knew nothing about it, and it was terrible. It's a terrible animation path. And we animated Garfield in Lightwave, and then I did a bunch of other movies all in Lightwave. And then eventually, at that studio, we did a movie called... Um, what was that movie? It's got that guy in it. Not at the museum. And that was sort of our first... We did that in Maya. That was our first foray into Maya. Um, you want me to extend for a half hour more? Uh, let's see, why not? You know what? I, I actually had a tattoo appointment today at 11, uh, but I canceled it. You want to see? It's this thing on my arm. And I'm like, well, why do I have a tattoo appointment when I already have a tattoo? That seems ridiculous. Seems redundant. Um, okay, so let's get between <laughs> these two poses. Very first thing that I do is I... Turn the damn sound off. It's super annoying. Deviant Marsupial, I would love to try TV paint. I'll take you up on that. I need to get one of those, uh... I mean, I have a tablet, but drawing on the tablet, and then when you look at the screen is weird, I need to get one of those Cintiqs. Um, so, now I'm going to go straight ahead. And I can go straight ahead because I'm all locked down, everything's good. So I'll think about, I'll start with my COG, because my COG is very important where it goes everything follows so i just want to make sure that it's traveling in a way see i'm going forward and, and cushioning down now this seems kind of uh, uh simple um deviant marsupial i don't play games i know it's terrible um but i it, my character is is moving at a at a um diagonal path of action and if i Go into my animation tab and I turn on visualize and create editable motion trail. And then I'll go into show and I'll make sure I'm showing motion trails. I can see that path of action. And it's just a straight line. It's very linear. Now it doesn't really matter in my perspective mode, but I like to just, I would like things to move in an arc. And what this, 
what this um, path of action is telling me is that my translation Y, which is almost always my vertical translation, up and down. Uh, Shalom, I don't use Anabot or Clean Machine. I know it's terrible. I don't have anything against it. I'm just, uh, I just, I've just developed different strategies. Probably should. I get asked that question. I think every, every one, of, every time I do one of these things, people are like, "What is the matter with you?" Uh, so I clearly need to jump on it. So it's a relationship between our vertical translation and our horizontal translation. That's all of it. This whole thing is just all about how your your characters are moving vertically and horizontally across the screen. It doesn't really matter depth. I mean, depth matters, but only in such only only as far as how your character is moving vertically and horizontally. And if you think about drawing the old traditional stuff, that's all they had. They didn't have depth. So if they had somebody moving towards moving away from the camera, they just draw it smaller consistently. But it would still have to have an arc. You couldn't just go like this because it would look like the character shrinking. There had to be some vertical and horizontal movement. Or else it would just look like the character being drawn smaller and smaller and smaller. So in this instance here, I want to have an arc on that. So I want to, the fact that it's moving in a diagonal on the COG means that the translation Y and the translation in this uh, situation is the Z or Z. They are starting and stopping at the exact same time. What's super interesting about this is that if I, if I take this translation Y, watch what happens. If I just take this translation Y key and I move it. Look, I start to get an arc. If I move it back this way. Get an arc. So what that means is that my character is starting to move down or they're moving forward. Why that looks like that. Kind of an odd. Delete that motion trail. Another one. Yeah, there. That's a that's a better representative. Sometimes the, the motion trails don't update. So now you can see we're coming down and then we're getting linear going across. So maybe I just offset that translation Y too much. So this way it sort of cushions. So now I have an arc. Alternatively, um, move that back. Alternatively, I could set a key. My translation Y. And in between them to get that arc. Just to have a little bit of an arc. I don't need much. Uh, Shalom, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter which way you do it. Whatever you're you're accustomed to. So so if you're accustomed to offsetting keys and that makes sense in your brain, then that's fine. You can visualize it. Then that's fine. Um, it it all depends. You know, I've, I've spent time thinking there are better ways and you should do it like this, you should do it like that. And there certainly is, there are better ways to do things depending on the, you know, you, you want to use the, the business end of the hammer to put in a nail. Uh, but sometimes the handle of the hammer is good for like digging things out of cracks of the, whatever. Anyway, I know I don't game. I've never gamed. Whatever works. Here's what I'd say, Shalom. Whatever... Whatever works visually on the screen, yes, 100%. But two, um, whatever affords you as an animator the, the clearest, cleanest workflow so you can make um, um, edits to your work quickly. In the industry, the one thing I've learned in the industry is it doesn't matter where, you are, where you're at in your shot, someone's going to ask for a ridiculous change. For your animation and so i try to stay as versatile as possible for as long as possible and for me that means some things and for other people it means other things so there's some things that i do people can go into my workflow and they can look at it and go this doesn't make any sense to me at all i get that because i go into other people's workflow and i go this doesn't make any sense and so as as, as what happens sometimes in the studio somebody gets sick or somebody leaves and they go well they didn't finish finish their shots so it gets handed over to you and you open up and go well i, I need to remake this in a in a in a form that I that I recognize, and so you got to kind of go through it and just go okay now I recognize this thing. You need to work on it without destroying the essence of. It. 
of 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 what the piece is. Um, Deviant Marsupial. I've, I've game since I was five years old. Well, I already told you when I was five years old, I was killing steers. So that that's my game. It's terrible. I I'm. You think I'd be? You think I'd be like a, a vegan like these auto tangents? But I'm not yet. Okay, so we get that sorted out. And I say to myself, self, I like this translation Y. I look at, I when I first open up my um, graph editor, if I see anything like that, like a plateaued curve that isn't the feet, the feet plateau, obviously, because you don't want them crashing to the floor. If I see a curve like that, I all, I'll, I'll always tweak it. And I, I'll always cushion toward the end of the hold, which is the end of the hold is always my extreme in that. Not always, but most. You know, I, I could... Uh, you know, I, I could do this, whereas I come down and bounce back. But I'm not doing that. I'm going to cushion into the extreme. Um, next, I'm going to um, concentrate on my torso. On, on my torso. And what I love about these body mechanic rigs is that if I select the global here, what is it called? The uh, the character node. It has all of these channels where I can hide things. And so I'm going to hide the arms because they confuse me. I'm going to hide the head too. And so now I, oh, and the neck. Really whack the keys on this. Um, so now I just want to, I can hide the legs. I just want to concentrate on this shape and how this shape is moving. And so by hiding all these things, I can kind of see what's going on here. So I want to get a little bit of overlap with my spine. Now it's, it's a very fast, movement and it's not moving very much it's not moving very far it's not very broad so um i i i don't i you got i want to be careful with it but i also want to make sure i get some movement because my character is sort of facing the screen it's not going to do me a whole lot of good to get overlap in the chest although i'll get some but you, it won't really read so my overlap is going to be drawn from vertical overlap so as my character starts to come down POG starts to come down. My character. And I'm going to move this key over. So I've offset this key now to 46. So my COG is settling before my chest is. And what that will do is give me a little bit of. You just see that little bounce. Now, I'll explore that even a bit more. Let's go to frame 48, see that, and then go back to 46, push this down a little bit. See a little bounce. I kind of like that, actually. It's kind of fun. Leave that bounce in there. The most, uh... oh, Shalom, try to keep your keys in the same frame for as long as you can. Yep, 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 I'm with you on that. Offsets do get really, really messy. I'm totally with you. I try to keep it as clean as possible for as long as possible. Uh, the most exotic animal I've ever eaten. Uh, boar. I've never eaten boar. Um, you ate, your, your dad ate a sheep's eyeball. Um, I, I've eaten all kinds of stuff like uh, pig knuckles and calf brains and, you know, because on a farm tongue. Um, I've never eaten any teeth. Funny. Probably no nutritional value in teeth. Um, but I did eat a, a, this isn't exotic. This is only exotic in that I don't live in the Philippines. But a friend of mine is from the Philippines and they eat balut. And it's, what that is is a 14-day-old duck fetus. Uh, that you, It's still in the egg. You hard boil or you boil it and then you peel it. There's a little duck in there and you pop that in your mouth. And uh, it's really just a texture sensation. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. Boar, um, I'm sure boar is nice. Like anything in that, that sort of like pig family. I mean, man, bacon. Are you kidding me? Uh, if I, if I, uh, if I taste like bacon, I just give myself over to the masses. What are you going to do? Okay, so I got a little overlap there. And so once that happens, it feels very localized here at the bottom of the chest. So I'm going to grab this hip. Ooh, let me get rid of that. I'm going to select the hip, and I'm going to get a little overlap with that too. So I'll move the 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 start of my hold with the hips because what my what my chest is doing 
Um, my hips are doing as well. I have eaten kangaroo, deviant marsupial. I did eat kangaroo when I was in Melbourne. It was on the menu, and I'm like, well, I'm in Melbourne. I might as well eat kangaroo. It tasted like a steak. It had the same texture as, a, as, a, as beef. Similar texture to beef. It was a little bland, but that's, uh, that's just probably how it was prepared. So if I consult my, what do you call it? Test, frame 43, I'm gonna push. And then my overlap, frame 48. And frame 46. We do the options. Down. And up. Zero that off. Pull it down. Down. Oop. Boom. Look at that. Woo! I'm not sure if you guys can see that. Quickly. Now I'll get some overlap. This this will read well. Uh probably better than the chest will. As we're coming down. I'm gonna bring the legs back back. There we go. I want to get a little bit of overlap with this um, hip controller. What if I bent it up? That. And when it bounces, offshoot a little bit. Back down. So now I'm overlapping the rotations a bit as well. Oh, yeah. I'll be sure. I'll be sure. You can see once it hits, and I'm looking at this line right here, and you can see as it comes down, once it gets here, it gets a bit sticky. I don't like how completely it, it freezes. The hip does work counter to the chest, yes. I'm using a mouse. So this, I'm animating the rotation Z. See, see that? That's too plateaued. In fact, it's overshooting a bit, but when it's only overshooting in my graph editor, if... This is my hold, remember, from uh, 48 now to 54. It's only overshooting that that much. That's going to um, that's going to that's going to appear to be a hold, like a, it's going to appear to be a, a frozen hold. So instead, what I'll do is I'll just give that a bit more cushion. These curves are always a little funky. That's okay. And so now there'll just be a bit of movement there. What um, I worked for this for this animation director for Fox uh, Films named Chris Bailey, and he he coined this phrase. I don't know if he coined it, but he he taught me this phrase called the imperceptible drift. And what the imperceptible drift means um, is that you're you don't for something like this. I don't want to see movement, but I don't want to feel it freeze. So the best way to describe it is an imperceptible drift, meaning that there is movement, but you don't see it. You just feel it. You can't perceive it by sight. So that's what I'm going for here, my imperceptible drift. I'm going to get some going on here as well. So as my, um, my spine is coming down, I'm going to drag, drag it out. I'm gonna drag it out. Then I'll overshoot it. Pushing it. And I can even offset. Here's something that I do, Shalom. This is gonna drive you crazy. But I'm gonna offset channels. Not just controls, but I'm gonna I'm gonna offset. So as my body comes up, or as the translation Y comes up, pushing into rotation. 
Look at that. Getting getting jiggy with it. Um, this thing here, I use it very sparingly. Can really make a mess of things. Give it a little bit of love. You can see that I'm just I'm 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 using these three controllers just to manipulate that shape, and all I'm doing with that shape is looking for opportunities for overlapping action. Have you ever animated in 12 frames per second, and and do you do anything differently? Not in Maya, no, no. I mean I I animated yeah 60 frames per second I think is what we were doing on the Hobbit films, but it's just the settings. It doesn't really. 60 frames per second doesn't mean you're setting more poses or anything. Same process. E48, then 46. I'll just push this thing out. Make sure that I'm not um, haven't lost my way. Now, with all that going on, I need to now, I've made a lot of changes. I've made a lot of changes. I've really grown. Um, I go to the gym. Uh, let's bring back the arms and the, the back. I'm gonna bring it back, see what that looks like. I love it. Let's see what it looks like in the camera. A little rocky. I'm not sure that I love I love that overlap. But let's just pretend we do. And more importantly, let's put some sound to it. A little warbly, but let's leave it for now. I can always, as well, um, tone it down a little bit just by. Just by adjusting these curves. Not going quite. Quite so far. Um, next, we'll work on these arms a bit. So I'll start with the shoulders. Body's coming down. Shoulders up. And hands down. Elbow out. And again, I'm thinking about my paths of action as well, so I want to get like a an arc through there. So I'm thinking about I'm thinking about this hand kind of arcing up around ultimately. And I'm going to um, offset this entire arm from this entire arm and from the body. Not too much, but just enough so it doesn't feel like everything's starting and stopping at the same time. Here's the thing that I do. You can see up here all of these uh, custom buttons. Um, I like, as a workflow strategy, is I, I'll shift select the entire right arm. Not the fingers, but the entire right arm. And then I will go to um, Create. Sets, quick selection set. I'll just call it our arm, right arm, and I'll click the add to shelf button. And that way I can always just select the entire arm with the click of a button rather than having to shift. And I'll do the same thing for the left. Mark, that's genius. Oh, shut. Anyway, 
Let's offset this a couple frames. Turn that piss off again. I think I want this extreme peak of the of the shoulder to happen on frame 45 and then drop down quite quickly here. This this clavicle is really going to dr uh, drive most of this stuff. Um, don't, I'm not necessarily going to do, do too much with this arm, or sorry, with the shoulder controller, but with the elbow controller, yes, and the fingers as well. I'll get into, but I'll I'll mostly do that later. But you know, I can dive in there and do some posing with that. But I typically I'll I'll refrain from getting distracted with the fingers because until I get all the rest of this stuff going, I'm just completely wasting my time with animating this. Completely wasting my time. So I just won't do it. So now is a good time to if I select this hand. Well, first I'll see how my timing is by doing a play blast. I don't necessarily need to play blast, and I probably wouldn't uh, uh, play blast as much as I do. But I think for what we're doing, I think the play blasts play more cleanly over the interwebs, from what I've learned. Uh, what do I think about the remake of the Animaniacs? Uh, the Animaniacs, that's a, that's a kind of a, a funky one. I was never a huge fan. Uh, I thought the... Um, I thought I thought the the style of animation was really good. I thought the the um the the, the way they executed all of it I thought was super pro and super good. I thought the just the overall vibe of it uh it, from a storytelling or from you know compelling nature. I I thought it was I thought it, I didn't think it was written well, I guess I'm trying to say I didn't like the way it was written. I, I don't, um, it just felt a little, just a, a little sloppy and uninteresting. Like. But, you know, um, that's just one man's opinion. So now if I look at this hand, or if I select this hand, and I go back to visualize, I'll throw another motion trail on that. And we'll see what that motion trail looks like. Pretty good. There's a little, tr the hole's a little troubling just right in here. There's something going on there. I'm not sure what that is. Because there's no, but I did notice that there's a little tiny jog right in here. Well, notifications What's happening. It's the it's a lot of times it's these sorts of curves that will do it because you they're, they're they're fairly complicated curves. So what I'll do is I'll using these uh oh for using these um using my auto you know tangents I'll go through and just flatten these these curves out a little bit just so there's not quite so much drip. A drip like this is fine. That's not. That's not troubling to me. Tighten that up a little. Um, I would just do that. Keep that curve where I want it. But little drifts like like this is a bit troubling. Is that the rotation X? And so if I want to know what's going on with my rotation X or how much, um, how much changing thing, I'll just move it around and then go. Oh, let's that. And my rotation X on my chest is my bowing forward backwards. And so I'm using OBS, Shalom. Yeah. Uh, the the I think the takeaway whenever I sort of dig in and and and, and start to, to go through my my process, um, what I what I hear back 
from a lot of animators and young animators or, or new animators is um, is the level of detail. And how much time I spend on, well, what is this here? 14 frames. Really, it's, yeah, it's 14 frames. And how much time and, and energy I, I put into it. And, and the, you know, when I, when I was first animating, um, didn't really know so much what I was doing process-wise. And so people would ask me, like, you know, I would animate something on a film or something. And people would say, like, you know, how did you do that? And I couldn't quantify it, really. I just would say something stupid like, well, I just kept doing it until it didn't look like crap anymore, which was absolutely true. I, I never knew really where I was going um, with, my, with my shots, but I just knew if I kept working at it, I'd figure it out. Now, that's a huge luxury in the film industry because you have massive, massive time, so much time. Um, and so... Uh, like we didn't really have deadlines there was no so i could just keep going and somebody would make a comment and i would change it and then I'd, it would be a mess and it was sort of a uh it was always a mess like that but when i started teaching um i can't have somebody who's paid me about who's paid me uh um to teach them how to animate and say hey how do i do this and i say well you just keep doing it until it doesn't suck anymore like that you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be doing anybody any, any sort of a service um Plus, as the demands on me grew because of uh, I, I started moving into like more sort of leadership roles, I also had to give very specific direction. Anyway, what my point was. Oh, the takeaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, what, what I'm doing here is, is once I have everything set up and I like what my poses are and I like the time between my poses, then I can dig in here and, and, and start to... to to really have some fun and really like challenge myself with this be like what it feels like to push stuff like we can get like this big overlap with the head and everything right now is sort of vertical overlap um and then i'm not spending a ton of time on it i'm getting my ideas across and if i do get lost which i do get lost sometimes then i can just go back in and go okay what was it again it was this pose and uh, it was one, I had this pose on 45, just these two poses, and I'll, oops, spinning ball of death. And I'll just find that original pose again. I think at 54 is what it is. And I can just grab all this stuff and just delete it. And I, 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 one, of the, one, of the, one of the things I like the most about doing this for so long um, when I first started animating, I'd get a piece of animation that was like, I don't know why it looks the way it looks, but I like it. I don't know how I did it, but I can't touch it because it's sort of like a Rubik's Cube. Like, I'm almost there, but now I'm afraid of it because if I mess something up, um, I might, uh, you know, crash. If I mess something up, then uh, I, I'm not sure how to get to get it back to where it was. And the more I've I've done this, the more cavalier or or the bigger chances i can take so i'm not scared to just um wipe out an hour's worth of work or whatever because i can just rebuild it so it doesn't frighten me so i'll just go back here again and say okay does this actually work does this movement actually work and that's important because if i'm having troubles in between straight ahead in between uh between two poses it might mean um that the two poses just don't work well together uh what about tiny tunes or pinky in the brain i did enjoy pinky in the brain yeah i thought that was well done um it was good character development good contrast with two characters oftentimes like that's what we're looking for is just a contrast with the two characters the the three characters in animaniacs um i just kind of found them annoying they were just way too clever they would look into the camera and go like ain't i a stinker i'm like oh don't do that Please don't do that. Um, that's annoying. Um, anyway, uh, here in India for cartoon episodes, we were asked to do six seconds output for the day. Yeah, yeah, we're not we're not able to bring out more detailed animation. Yeah, no, I I worked with animators that were under the same sort of conditions. Um, and so what happens in those the animators that I've worked with 
And I, I worked with some at Sony that, that had worked for a, a, a company called Nerdcore, which had this similar output. And so what I found with those animators is that they were, and they were really talented and they were really good fast at blocking out their animation. But when it came to finessing it, they didn't, they had to, they had to sort of develop an eye for it. They hadn't spent a lot of time finessing. And so the director would be like, yeah, that's great. And then when it got, got into finessing, that's when they slowed down. And that's when the conversation was like, oh no, you look at the thumb, look at the path of action of the thumb, like just levels of detail. And I mean, at Sony, you know, they're talking about, they're frame by framing like the top eyelid. The shape of the top eyelid on this frame is a little funky. So like it's micromanaging like every single pixel on um, and so you get you get a bit of you get a bit of time to do that because it's it's just important and and the bigger the bigger the budget obviously the more time you get that's all really the budget does we had eight to nine seconds a day of final animation uh but to be hair. Oh, you're animating hair? Jamal? But to be fair. Eight to nine seconds a day. Wow, that is. Hair to air fair. <laughs> gotcha. Um, that, is a, that is intense. Well, listen, that brings us to the end. Um, I'd like to, the, ne the next step after this phase is, is once I sort of, I just continue doing passes, then I start to add detail. Um, and I don't do a lot of detail at this, like I showed you I was doing fingers, but I don't really do that so much either. I'll, I'll go, I'll do a final pass where I'll add details. It's almost as if I'm using animation layers, which I'm not using, I wouldn't use personally for this type of, Shot. but it's kind of the same thing um i'm keeping it as broad as possible for as long as possible thank you deviant marsupial this is super fun it's a it's it's um it's a it's a great way to spend a friday morning with all of you talking about um animation which i love and talking about uh me which i also love <laughs> Hey, uh, hit me up anytime. Check in with CG Spectrum. Uh, if you go to the CG Spectrum YouTube channel, um, there's lots of stuff on there uh, that could be helpful. There's a, so many resources out there. Um, Chiara Pori, who is an Italian animator, she has a website called IWantToBeAnAnimator.com, and she has wonderful tutorial, tutorials there. She's great. So just go ahead and Google IWantToBeAnAnimator.com. Um, but she's got, I love her stuff. The really good, a really good resource to sort of supplement your patient education. They're nice, quick assignments that you can kind of pound a bit about overlapping action and arcs. And All right. Wonderful. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. And I will see, hopefully, see you next. Adios, amigos.